I know that with Pixar you have to pitch three ideas in order to make a short film, but what exactly happens? Like, is, is it a time of year where everybody on campus is like, you know, it's the pitch competition is coming up or something like that? Well, I'll, I'll answer just because Sanjay was lucky enough. Oh, sorry, I'm creaking over. Sanjay was lucky enough not to have to go through that process. I have participated in that process since then with some other filmmakers. So to answer your question, um, periodically the studio decides, all right, it's time for us to figure out who's going to be doing the next shorts. And they put out the call, and anybody can come up with three ideas and pitch them. And um, we, a, a committee listens to them, and then we kind of pare it down. And those individuals pitched to John Lasseter, so they pitched their three ideas. But Sanjay had a different path, if you want to describe your path. Uh, <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, I never had any ambitions to make a short film. I was really satisfied. Um, I, I was uh, doing picture books and graphic novels at home on my spare time, kind of under a rock, and so <laughs> I was really happy just working by myself in solitude, and then at during the day, I'd like come and do my day job at Pixar, and I was really happy doing that. But I think bit by bit, you know, the books had sort of found an audience, and uh, you know, even the Asian Art Museum in town kind of reached out, and I like put up two shows there. And, and at some point, I even had the opportunity to put up some artwork there at Pixar, do a gallery show there. And I think that's when I think John sort of saw the work, and he was really sort of enamored with it. And they had approached me about doing something with it. And I was just always very scared. <laughs> I was very embarrassed of my culture growing up. I was still really nervous about putting it out there. I was really... It just took me a long time to sort of finally kind of arrive in my own skin, arrive in my own identity, and just doing the work at home just felt like therapy in some ways. And how about in terms of like coming into your own within the world at Pixar? Was there some point in your career with them where you're like, you know, I'm ready to like step it up and take it to the next level? No. <laughs> no, never. We, we dragged him to the next level. Because <laughs> his stories were so great, and he's such a good storyteller, and he had such a fresh perspective um, that I think, you know, John, John Laster said, I really want to see what you can do, and then other people kind of helped him develop an idea. He went to development, great team there, and drew these stories out, and uh, finally settled on this father-son story that was really based on his own personal life which is not where he intended to go initially. So the father-son story is kind of a true story, right? Yeah, oh yeah, that's definitely <laughs> a true story. <laughs> and did it also grow out of those books that you made? Well, I mean, that's the seed of it all. I mean, gosh, every morning I was like, yeah, I was wondering to watch G.I. Joe and Transformers and my dad would be meditating and of course it was time to sit with him instead of watching the cartoons. And so, oh yeah, that was my reality for a good like 12 years. Um, and so I'm never going to forget, given that I make cartoons and animation, that was a big deal to be able to be, that I was separated from the things that I loved growing up. And so um, when we were pitching the concepts to John, he asked me a little bit about my background. And uh, I did one drawing, you know, just to kind of illustrate how I grew up. My dad was on one side of the room and, we're, and I was on the other side. We were both kind of worshiping in our shrines. And this is exactly what I told John, you know, my dad worshipped his gods every morning and I worshipped mine. And straight away John just, you know, he grabbed him and, you know, really did ring true to him because it was true. That's exactly what I, how I grew up. Is that superhero show in the movie based on anything real that you used to watch? Oh yeah, I mean, I was obsessed. If Super Friends came on, that was a big deal. <laughs> Animation what it wasn't, isn't what it used to be and so, yeah, I mean, I mean, I was like, you know, a weakling little kid. I'm still like trying to like not be weakling, but any kind of superhero <laughs> show for like any kind of like nerdy kid, it was like a big like those those guys kick butt and they're like you're coming cool out power. with a short film that's going to be attached to a Pixar feature. You're not a weakling anymore. I can assure you. <laughs> you know, I'm still like nerdy comic book guy though. <laughs> that's the hot thing right now, though. We're we're all at the top now. <laughs> You've arrived, so yeah, you've arrived. All right, all right. Accept it. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about the timeline for a short film and how it compares to the feature? How long from start to finish does something like this take? Well, this one took about three years, a year and a half to develop, and then a year and a half in production. And because we're short films, we have to fit in between the production cycles of the feature films, and, and it's a very finite uh, number of resources that they dedicate to us. So 
as much as it seems like, wow, you have the resources of an entire feature animation studio at your fingertips, it's actually not quite true. They basically say, fit in here, go. And so I think that, that's how we, we schedule the shorts. It's like, oh, there's a little gap there. OK, go for it. It was also really an incredibly ambitious short. You know, in hindsight, it's been reflected to me, like multiple characters, multiple sets, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, not the normal shot count. I mean, no. every level, it just seemed what like. What is the normal shot count? Um, 70? Yeah, we, I mean, well, there's averages. I mean, if you look at the, at the history of the length of our short films, they've gradually been creeping up, and we were trying to keep it at seven minutes. We were like, <laughs> wringing every frame out of it, shortening it. So <clears throat> you'll see that the last films were a little bit shorter. I think Lava is about the same length as us. So This was reminding me a little of uh, Inside Out, where you had like the real world and the mind world. You have the real world here, and then you have that dreamlike yeah. world there. Did, right. did you take a similar approach to, to that that they did with Inside Out, in terms of like the whole development process, production design, all that? Well, the dream world was actually based more on reality, actually, than certainly than Inside Out. Yeah. And, I mean, you should talk about your historical research. Well, that, that part came pretty quickly in terms of, I always knew that, you know, the boy was kind of, well, I'll speak for myself. <laughs> I was brought to Southern California, and I was raised in this sort of box. And uh, I never got to experience one of these incredibly ornate kind of museum-like temples until I was like 40, oh, 35, 40. I mean, when you go, you will see very dramatically and very vividly it is covered on every inch with these mythological friezes and reliefs. And it's like essentially like a comic book come to life. But that's not what I was exposed to. I was exposed to an immigrant box. <laughs> and so I always knew that having studied Indian art and discovered all this stuff that, oh, I really want to take my eight-year-old self there because maybe that would be the thing that could help inspire the sensitivity and this appreciation. And so we referenced that straight away. It was then the third sort of set that we took, which was we then dissolved this temple and turned it into this sort of manifestation of light. And this kind of this cosmic realm, that took a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And the music for that, that part felt very unique too. It's like a, I guess like a rock song. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the theme of the cartoon, right? <laughs> But <laughs> yeah, so we were like so lucky that we got to work with this amazing composer, Michael Dana. He did uh, The Life of Pi as well as many other like beautiful scores. Mm -hmm. And um, so straight away we, we began talking, Michael and I, and I mentioned that I was a new father. My son's, my son's name is Arjun. And he kind of did a double take and he's like, that's, that's, that's crazy. He's like, he's like, my son's name is Arjun. I'm like, what? This is, you know, a Caucasian guy from Canada. I'm like, what? <laughs> and it turns out his wife is Bengali, and uh, he had just this true depth of experience and knowledge and appreciation for the culture. And so when it came to scoring that moment when the boy and the deities meet, um, not only does he reprise the theme from the superhero cartoon in the beginning, which is kind of these synths and these kind of guitars, <laughs> he kind of reprises it in a way that just feels more epic and sort of, I don't know, cosmic. And then he switches into, he introduces the Bansuri flute. This is a very spiritual instrument from India. And he had the sensitivity to know that that would be very appropriate for a certain deity. And again, this is something that my parents would appreciate um, and somebody from that culture would appreciate, but it just gave it this layer of authenticity and sensitivity that I'm not sure if another composer would have gotten to. We were really fortunate to work with him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And how about the whole look with the lighter part of that portion of the film? Because I, I was looking at that and all I kept thinking about was that the geometry light that they made for Joy and like whether or not you could use that to kind of have the light come off of them in all directions, mm -hmm. where in a way that it would light the set too appropriately. Well, that was definitely a part of the process, trying to figure out how this, the lighting in the set would affect those characters. And oh my God, that was so hard. As, as the set dissolved, right? I mean, we were going into, as you said, like this this infinitude of space. <laughs> yeah, it just felt like, you know, if the, the story begins with this boy in this confined box, I really wanted it to sort of go into this infinite realm. In terms of the lighting, you know, we, we did, took in a lot of inspiration from the auroras, from the northern lights, and what we wanted was, you know, we wanted the sort of the details of the temple to remain, but for those walls to dissolve so it could feel infinite and yet still feel familiar. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, uh, we had a brilliant sort of technical director, uh, Darwin Peachy, who figured out a way to sort of create the sticker of a background and then sort of mm -hmm. reveal, like I think he worked with Bill Wittrell, our, our effects lead. It was a 
very tight union yeah. there, it's kind of unusual, to have these auroras kind of reveal the temple as they moved and undulated. And so you just got this feeling that the whole place was alive with energy. Mm -hmm. And now how about the design of the actual people too? Because obviously what I noticed most are the, the big bold eyes. Did you know you wanted that look for them right from the start or did you ever toy with anything else? You know, if you actually look at a lot of South Asian art, the eyes are so vivid. You know, there's this concept called darshan. Darshan is when you see the divine and the divine sees you. That's the concept in Southeast Asian sort of belief. And so the eyes are always much more prominent. They're always done in a different sort of quality of stone, the coral. Like the, typically the figures are in stone, but there's always these inlaid eyes. And so I always knew that, you know, in animation in particular, you know, you just these, the eyes are such a window into sort of the soul. And so we, I always knew that we wanted to sort of create these eyes that can really sort of lock with the boys. And so there's this kind of cosmic transmission that could take place when we needed it to. And another thing that we were looking for is a kind of androgynous quality to these deities so that they were both powerful but also elegant and graceful. graceful. And I mean, if you look at the design, like the, the deities have these very delicate feet and hands and their movements, are, which were inspired by Indian martial arts and dance, traditional dance, are very both powerful and graceful. Um, we, we did a lot of research actually on that movement. I feel like you need that kind of like level of expressivity when you have no dialogue too, which Slice. I thought was, is that a choice you guys make? Because I mean, I, now that I'm thinking about it, most Pixar shorts, I guess, don't, I mean, except for Lava that have a whole song maybe, but there's right. not much dialogue. No, no, that's something that we really try to minimize. I mean, the, they're, they're considered tributes to, to pure animation. And so it is our opportunity to honor movement and animation and, and storytelling that is simply based on visual. It made me listen out for so many different sounds too that I, yes. I don't normally listen for. Like even when he just like places the toy on the counter, oh, like great. the little bits oh, and like when great. they clap their hands together, something like that sounds great. so specific and you've it has made, like a bigger effect. You've made our sound designer very happy <laughs> yes. like, noticing Thank those you. things. Yes. <laughs> we have a very, very talented sound designer who, who works so hard to to place each one of those sound effects and, and created a lot of things to to And it's like you're saying, he he'd always reminded me, he's like, Sanjay, it's great when it goes completely quiet because then you could really celebrate two palms joining yes. or a uh, toy being set down. Like you could really celebrate that sort of those yeah. details. The, the, the lighting so of the candle. Just yeah. I hear that every time that so we light the candle. Now, can you guys talk a little bit about being paired with a specific feature? Because I know there was a little shuffling in the schedule. So were you guys always meant to be with the good dinosaur, or was originally Lava was supposed to be with that? Probably that's how it would have lined up. But truthfully, we don't um, produce the shorts with that in mind. They're, they're, interestingly, we just produce them in isolation. And we start to say, oh, I think we're going to be paired with that feature. But we don't think about it. It's not a prominent part of the decision. We just make our, our films and then we see how they work out and, and it's it's kind of fun to do it that way. It's not by design to see what what pairing emerges. <laughs> Is that something you're like nervously awaiting? Like I don't know when you receive I'm thinking about like getting a grade back from a test. Like when you get that <laughs> film and you find out what you're being paired with. Are you like nervous to find out what it is? You know, it's not something we focus on. We really just focus on the film that we're making quite honestly and then you know you look up and go, "Oh, that's interesting. That's where it's going to go." And then it, it takes on a new life when it, it's out there in the world with this feature film. So now what's the next step for you? I mean, I, I imagine on a producer's track, the next step would be a, a feature, a full yes. a producer credit on a feature? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm working on something that we haven't, we're not talking about, but yes, I'm working That's on awesome. that. Sanjay and I happen to be working on the same project, which is very nice.